Welcome back to the Global Startup Movement. Today is our second installment from our Ecosystem Insights series. In this series, we are filtering through our three years of past interviews to bring you some of the top insights about building startups anywhere in the world. If you missed our last one, be sure to go back 12 episodes to check out our top five insights on building startups in Africa. Today, we're diving into the Latin America ecosystem, which includes Mexico, Colombia, Chile, Brazil, Argentina, and the rest of the Central and South American ecosystems. We've had some fantastic guests from throughout the region, and in many ways, the Latin American countries are very similar to Africa and have some similarities to Europe as well. For every challenge in this ecosystem, there's also an opportunity, whether it's infrastructure, mobile phone penetration, or uniquely low-cost labor for the sharing economy platforms. There are many interesting dynamics about building startups in Latin America. For our first insight today, we have a clip from an episode with Jonathan Louie, who is a co-founder at Investo, which is a seed stage firm investing in Latin America, but based in Silicon Valley. Jonathan does a fantastic job at laying out the different markets, the different market sizes, and even addresses a unique challenge and a unique opportunity in the ecosystems. So in terms of market size, I think that Latin America offers a pretty interesting market. Mexico is 125 million people. You have Brazil, that's 180. You can combine Mexico with Colombia and, and a few others, you can get to easily to 200 million people. So I guess it's, and it's all Spanish speaking, same time zone, more or less. I guess it's, it's a pretty interesting market. There are challenges because the market is not as prepared. The access to smartphone or to internet is not the same as the US. The access to bank accounts and credit card is not as popular or as like not everybody has a credit card yet, but that's also a lot of opportunity for Mexican company. I guess that one of the mistakes of many founders is to take something that's successful in the US and try to replicate it stupidly in, in, in the Mexican market without taking into consideration the local condition. That has, has been, I think, one of the biggest mistakes many founders have done. On the contrary, you have a lot of companies like um, one of the companies we invested called Rappi. They are from YC. They actually took something that was really successful in the US and made it even more profitable and, and even with a bigger scope in Latin America. So they took something like Postmates or Uber Eats that make delivery in the US, but they said the beauty here is that the labor is a lot cheaper. So you can actually order anything you want for a couple of dollars and they will bring it to you. Uh, so, so the market, instead of going only after the, the rich people and the few percentage that can afford paying a, a huge markup on having it delivered to their place, they, they actually have access to almost, I would say, the big majority of people that, that actually can pay one or two dollars more in order to get the food or the grocery delivered to their doors. And then he even dives into the Spanish versus Portuguese markets, which is similar to the differences of Francophone uh, French-speaking Africa and Anglophone English-speaking. You first have to divide Latin America in two. You have Latin America, like the Spanish-speaking Latin America, which is basically Argentina, Colombia, uh, Chile, Peru, uh, Mexico. So all those countries that speak Spanish, which is a little bit easier. And then you have uh, Brazil, which which speaks Portuguese, which is a, a, a whole new market uh, on itself. You have some company that has been successful uh, working in both, uh, but it's, it's, that's a little bit harder. And the difference between Mexico and Argentina, there are certain differences, but it's, a, it's probably a little bit easier when they speak the same language and they have, they're on the same time zone um, or more or less on the same time zone. I guess that it will depend on the product too. You have certain products that's pretty easy to cross border and others that are very local. So it will depend on the startup also how difficult it is. Now, when it's difficult, it's also an opportunity for the startup because it blocks also other companies to be able to work in different countries. So it's not always something negative. Next up, we have Marcus Dantis from Startup Mexico, who is a definitive leader in the ecosystem. Uh, a great ecosystem player, and he's even one of the sharks on the Mexican version of Shark Tank. One of the issues that we cover a lot about the South American and Central American ecosystem is the lack of corporate activity in these markets and the speed at which they're launching venture arms much slower than the rest of the world. So here's Marcus filling us in on why the corporates haven't gotten more involved in the startup ecosystem in Mexico. 
I think it has to do with many things. I think it has to do with with culture, in the sense that Mexicans that are very averse to risk and and uh, and we don't tolerate failure and we punish success and you know all those kinds of things. I think it also has to do with protectionism. You know, for many many years Mexico was you know had a lot of monopolies and these monopolies were pretty safe and couldn't really be bothered by startups. I also think because the ecosystem is very young as well. You know, it's probably an ecosystem that's like the real ecosystem is five, six years old. And and we don't have that many success stories. So once we start getting those success stories, once we start getting these companies growing and, you know, exiting properly, I think that the corporates are going to get more into the game. But now, this past couple of years, there's a lot of corporates that have entered into the startup uh, game and into the entrepreneurship and innovation ecosystems. We are still way behind many other countries, but I think that that this is going to happen pretty fast. So I do believe that entrepreneurs who are operating in emerging and frontier markets are some of the toughest people in the world. On top of all the normal startup challenges, you have a serious lack of local capital, a lot of uncertainty in the macroeconomic condition in your country, and many other problems caused by things that we really take for granted here in the West, including consistent power, good roads, and decent infrastructure. So here's Lisa Besserman from Startup Buenos Aires on why she thinks the tough macroeconomic climate is the toughest challenge that entrepreneurs in the region have to face, but why it could also be one of the greatest opportunities. Without a doubt, anyone you ask this question will say the same thing. It's the volatility of, of the macroeconomic climate in Argentina. It, um, you know, it's a very real problem. It's definitely a huge obstacle, you know, and, and it, it barrier to entry, you know, when it comes to either investing in, in Argentina, because it is a risky place to invest in, or starting a company or creating partnerships, because, you know, the economic climate is just incredibly volatile. And right now, it, it's not in a great position. Um, you know, that being said, I think, you know, necessity breeds innovation. And if anybody is resilient. It's definitely Argentine entrepreneurs and, and out of this has created this really strong crypto um, community. And according to the Bitcoin market uh, potential index, Argentina is the country with the single greatest potential for digital currencies. And many cryptocurrencies have launched and started from Buenos Aires. I believe there's like about 150 venues that accept Bitcoin in Buenos Aires. And that's compared to, I think, 90 in London and, and 80 something in New York. So while, yes, the, the macroeconomic climate is really difficult in Argentina, I think it's also created this new level of innovation that startups and, and technologists are really quick to adapt and to innovate. And I think, you know, with this whole crypto cryptocurrency market, I think Argentina is absolutely going to come out on top um, because they need to. And, um, you know, when Bitcoin first started, Argentina had the most Bitcoin startups in the world. And, you know, that's just uh, it just shows, you know, how resilient these entrepreneurs are and, and how, you know, they don't rely on, you know, centralized organizations to to help, um, you know, them grow them grow it as, as entrepreneurs or, or as as company owners. So yes, while while the macroeconomic climate is really tough at the moment in Argentina, I think that's also going to create this next wave of, of really innovative and out-of-the-box startups, um, and especially this adoption of, of cryptocurrency market. So as you all know, I'm a big believer in cryptocurrency and blockchain, and I think that's where finance is headed towards. And so I do believe countries like Argentina will have an advantage in this ecosystem as it grows. Next up, we have Roberto Musso, who has a wealth of knowledge on building startups in emerging markets. He's built numerous successful technology companies in Chile and is now an active angel investor and leader of the ecosystem. In this clip, Roberto presents some of the ideas in his Startup Journey project, which is a framework that he's created after years of how to build startups in emerging markets and what are the unique challenges. 92% of our startups, they just fail before their third year. Just fail 92%. That's a lot. So, since we have been involved, I mean, my partners and myself in entrepreneurship for 20 years, we have been facing this failure ourselves and we have been looking, we have been watching other people to fail the same way. So, we, we found this problem very interesting to 
try to solve it. So we start studying what could we do in order to solve it. And we found out that the reason for this huge failure, first of all, we, we lack money. We are poor countries, so we don't have that much money to fund our startups. That's a problem. Our big companies, they don't innovate that much because they don't compete. They don't compete strongly as in the developed countries. That's a very huge problem because they don't need to innovate. And that's why they don't need to collaborate with the startups, for instance. And the third thing is that our, our founders, our entrepreneurs, they just try to do the same things the entrepreneurs of developed countries do. I mean, the methodologies they are following are those developed in the, in the developed countries. So, and that's a huge mistake because if you want to raise some money here, some, some funding, you mainly cannot do that. You will fail because we lack money. Or if you want to, for instance, just get traction for your startup as maybe, I don't know, Instagram does or WhatsApp does, uh, you, you will fail because you, you won't have any money to, to pay the rent or to pay the salaries. So the methodologies should be very different, very adapted to the scenarios we face here. So that has been mainly our findings and we have been uh, working a lot on trying to discover what those that have had success have done here. So we have found that um, they, for instance, they are focusing a lot on getting to break even. And that's very reasonable because if you don't focus on breaking even, you just fail, you just die. We have found that if you focus too much on getting funded by a venture capital, for instance, you mainly lose your way to, to revenue, so you fail. And so you shouldn't focus that much on, on getting funded here. What we have found is that if you can find a company which can be named maybe as a parent company or something like that, Some, a big company that can help you to get funded month by month just in order to survive, you can maybe get to break even and then start to accelerate. So that has been a very good practice. And finally, we have Jose Carrasso, who is the co-founder and CEO of Slidebean. I'm sure many of you know Slidebean very well. They are a very well-known startup coming out of the Costa Rican ecosystem. And early on, Jose entered Slybean into the Startup Chile program, which is an equity-free accelerator in Santiago, Chile, and is one of many Latin American countries that use this equity-free grant tactic to try to attract more startups. The data is yet to come in on whether this tactic is going to be successful in the long run, but here's Jose's thoughts on how effective he thinks they'll be. Yeah, again, I think it could be a double-edged sword. So the reality is that Latin America is behind in terms of startups tech compared to the U.S. You know, that's just a reality. And then what happens, like if, if entrepreneurs in Argentina or, or in Chile um, know that there is a small ecosystem that, that's probably not going to help them thrive, they will leave the country anyway. You know, Argentina, Chile, they're losing that talent to the U.S. because investors would just rather move to the United States and build their companies there. So building these programs, these equity fee programs, is, a, is really an investment and a risky investment by the government. And that's something that I think we should certainly appreciate for the Chilean government, for example, to invest literally millions and millions of dollars every year, giving them equity free to entrepreneurs abroad. It's a big risky investment they're making in making Chile a stronger startup hub and then Obviously, at the very beginning, some of the companies will not find the resources or the investors they need to thrive and they will leave. But hopefully after X amount of years, the country will become that hub and then they will, that investment will be paid back time and time again. So, you know, it, it's a risky investment. And, and the reality is that Latin American governments are forced to make these investments, these risky investments to try to catch up 
and play catch up with the U.S. The U.S., you know, as a government, they don't need to come up with equity free programs. There's there's more than enough venture capital and private capital to develop and, you know, to build what, what Silicon Valley has become. But we are playing catch up. And then the government helping out with that is, I think, fundamental, even though it's a very risky investment. So there you have it. Five insights on building businesses in Latin America from five of the leading figures in ecosystems across the region. I hope you enjoyed this episode. As I mentioned, I really want to start creating a lot more insight-driven content. And be sure to subscribe to the Global Startup Movement on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, or wherever you get your podcasts, so that you don't miss Episode 3 of the Ecosystem Insight Series, where we will dive into the EU ecosystem.